Good morning, everyone. Uh, it's, it's an absolute pleasure uh, to be here today and speaking to all of you on something that I'm very passionate about, and that's sustainable mobility and where the future of this mobility is going to take us. Um, sustainable mobility is going to be driven by being electric. It's going to be driven by being shared. It's going to be driven by the fact that it's going to be autonomous. It's going to be completely air connected and it's going to be in an area of driven by renewable energies. And while these, some of them seem esoteric, you've already got electric vehicles working today. Uh, a lot of you probably took a shared service to come here today. Um, you're seeing the first signs of autonomous driving uh, globally happening with Google and others. Um, today with your smartphone, you can connect your cars already in many, in many directions. And renewable energy today in India is available at 4 rupees 50 paisa, it's cheaper than probably regular power as you look at it on this front. So it's not a figment of imagination, it's really here something that we can do and work towards. Electrics have made a lot of stride, you know, in the last few years. I mean, it used to take approximately uh, eight hours to charge a vehicle. Today, these vehicles can be charged in, in probably an hour uh, with fast charging. They can drive today over 500 kilometers of range on a single charge. Uh, these are production vehicles available today that you can buy. So it's not that it's, that it's away on, on a different uh, paradigm. If you think of where this is going to go in the future, you're going to see another big shift. Batteries can do uh, going from one hour to be charged in probably less than eight minutes. In fact, today you can charge batteries of some types in less than 10 minutes to 80% charge. So it's in the next 10 years to get it down to under 10 minutes is not going to be a problem on this area. Performances of batteries are going up around 8% year on year. Prices are coming down 8% year on year. So therefore, the cost structures of these batteries are going to be probably half of this where we stand in the future. And you're going to start to see ranges that are significantly larger. And what this means is that range anxiety, which is always seen as a big challenge for electric vehicles, is probably going to completely disappear. And, and, and it's going to be no more question about how far you can go anymore on this front. But more importantly than this, it's about to see what does this transform the solution. I think technology is great, but when technology marries business models is when I think you see the largest transformation potential that you can see on this area. And that's what I think the future holds as we take this forward. So if I think of electric cars today, but taking a step back, even regular vehicles, What's happening today is with, with improvements in aerodynamics and reduction in weight by using composites, by reduction in rolling resistance, the energy used to transport vehicles are going to reduce by around 10%. That's going to lower our cost. So we started by X, we end up at 0.9X. Right? On top of that, if you then take an electric vehicle, an electric machine is around 90% efficient, the gasoline engine is around 25% efficient. So three to four times more efficiency gets you another 20% reduction in terms of what the energy requirements would be in terms of cost structures. You couple this with the solar talk we just had about where the cost structures are, you get a further 10% reduction on cost structures as you take this forward. We then looked at shared mobility right now. In shared mobility, basically what happens is, is you're trying to use the same asset over, over a much higher duty cycle. And so, uh, for example, if you use a car share, uh, one car can replace 10 vehicles. So if you're going to share a mobility service, be it ride share, car share, uh, Ola or an Uber or anything else, you're going to start to see another 20% reduction because of optimization of an asset use utilization that you're going to have. If you then take and make it autonomous, where you now remove a large portion of the cost of such a solution, which is driver, you start to see another 30% reduction on this area. And then you add connectivity to the entire equation, you start to see another 10% reduction. And here by connectivity, I mean more the network effect. You know, let's take Whitefield, suburb of Bangalore. 50,000 people want to go in the morning. Um, you know, with all your apps, you know when you're going, where you're going. So in real time, if I can extrapolate this whole aspect, and see how I optimize a transport solution, I would probably get a 10% reduction on this area. What does this mean for all of us? It means a transformation of how we get from point A to point B. It's going to probably cost us 70% less um, to get from point A to point B. With all the efficiencies in transportation, all the efficiencies in autonomous vehicles, the all efficiencies in the connectivity, you're probably going to need a significantly lower amount of energy, probably 75% less energy to transport a person from point A to point B. 
Now that to me is the future. It's about getting from point A to point B much, more, much faster and quicker, using a lot less energy on this area and doing it in a clean and sustainable manner as we think of this. So let's take the context today of India. I mean, we import 80% of our oil right now. Uh, we have a large drain on that. We are a developing economy. We're not growing at one or two percent. We have aspirations to grow at eight or ten percent. If we're going to grow at eight to ten percent, we're going to need energy at probably that level, if not higher, for us to have a sustainable growth on this area. And this often causes a conflict in developing nations, as you can think about it, where climate change and energy security pose two challenges for us as we look at this area. On top of that, we have today over 200 million vehicles on our roads. This is two-wheelers, three-wheelers, cars, buses all put together. And on an annual basis, we grow 10% year on year. On the other side, we seem to have some ideal conditions for electric vehicles. Our distances are much smaller. Our vehicles in generally are much uh, are, uh, are smaller. We have a lot of stop and go, which means a lot of recuperation of energy can come. And these three factors end up making electric mobility more affordable both from a purchase point of view and running cost point of view compared to some countries in the West which may not have the same conditions. So it's really ideal from an electric mobility perspective. But then to link to the energy side of it, we also have over 300 days of sunshine in the country. And, and that works very well for us to see in terms of where we can do and use solar energy as a big driver in, this, in, in our entire ecosystem. So starting from this, to me, there's an opportunity for us as a country to really run on the sun. And, and there are a lot of strides being made in terms of where renewable energy is going in this space. So in India, by 2022, we're going to probably have around 100 mega gigawatts of solar energy that we could look at this area. Interestingly enough, India would have around 30 million vehicles produced that year in 2022, the way it's growing. Now, only 25% of this energy could po probably power all those vehicles that were produced in 2022 of the solar energy that we would have by then. That's pretty phenomenal in terms of the amount of energy required. But let's step into the future and say, where, where, where are we going to be by 2030? Well, by 2030, India is going to have approximately 400 million vehicles on its roads. Uh, these are all kinds of transportation put together. We have pretty aspirational ideas in terms of renewable energy also, where we're really trying to push both solar, wind, and other areas of renewable energy, and look at probably around 300 gigawatts of renewable energy by that time. Now, if we start to think that some of these vehicles we talked about are shared and autonomous, then probably this 400 million vehicles, um, we will come down to around 320, and that's very important because you know, Bangalore traffic's not getting better or neither is anywhere in the country or the world. And so that's going to be an important aspect. And then if you look at the energy to power that, we're going to need around 260 gigawatts of energy for that area of solar energy. And that's within the renewable targets that we can see by 2030. Now, taking this from an India context, going back to Rajasthan, which is probably one of our sunniest states in the country and has a large amount of uh, desert and open land on this area. If we were to take 5.5% of the land in Rajasthan, cover that with solar panels, that's just a little bit of speck of a dot that you see there, right? We'd be able to have enough power for all our vehicles in 2030 to run on the sun, on this area. So we can make a phenomenal shift as we think of how we can look at it within the perspective of energy and mobility. While this is at a national level, Solar also has a chance to be used in, in vehicular application. Um, today, the best cells are approximately 24% efficient. Costs are coming down to less than a dollar a watt, and in some cases, probably 40 to 50 cents a watt. In which case, I've taken examples of two types of transportations we see around our cities very often. We look at, at auto rickshaws, and we look at buses that are being used here. If today these have solar panels on them, while they may not be able to give you the complete energy they use every day, over a 10-year period, 100 to 120,000 kilometers could be completely run on solar power even today with the technology that's available. Interestingly enough, compared to an IC equivalent, this is going to be eight times cheaper and a significantly lower payback. Now, if we took this technology and just bumped it 20% better, 20% more efficient, no issues at all, 
if we look at the fact that the way the costs are coming on extrapolated, probably sell costs are going to be around 50% of where they are. What does that mean for something similar to this? It starts to even create more transformational change where probably you're 15 times cheaper and payback of such technologies could be less than uh, a year in doing this area. And that's when I start to see a transformational change at an individual level. Now, if you're thinking that I have personal transportation and how do I start to make an impact on this whole area? Well, an average person in India drives around 12,000 kilometers a year. So a two meter by three meter panel can probably cover that distance for you. And interestingly enough, have a payback of less than two years. Putting the same thought processes on solar technology of, in terms of improvements of efficiency, in terms of reductions of costs that we look at, and then over time, this can probably have a payback of less than one year. So it's no more about being green power, but it's actually being a cost-effective solution that everyone can adopt. And if every household did that, then they can run on the sun themselves, irrespective of how we see the country's larger objectives of moving in that direction here. A key challenge to, to, to energy and solar energy, of course, comes with storage. Everyone says, well, you know, solar energy is going to have peaks. Where the hell are you going to store this area? So I think the storage part becomes very important as, as you look at it. But I want to twist the storage into thinking of storage that could be democratized, storage that can be seen as being flexible on this area. So to give you an idea, energy density of batteries are around 250 watt hours per kg. They're going to be going up again around 8% year on year. Let's take an example which a lot of you in this room have probably come today in is on your two wheelers here, right? Probably do 50 kilometers a day using such technology, a small 10 kilogram pack lighter than your backpack that you can lift off, size of a loaf of bread, could probably swap your batteries and give you 100 kilometers of range in two minutes, possible today with the battery technology on this area. As you think of this technology growing in the future and the way it's growing, you're going to start to see uh, energy density is hitting 500 watt hours per, kg, uh, per kilogram. And this is without, I would say, fundamental shifts. There are some um, really holy grails which could make this 750 or 1000 watt hour per kg, but 500 is definitely achievable if we take a path of the next 10 years or where we want to look at technology. Taking the same thing that you had, all of a sudden, you could probably have over 200 kilometers range with a small little pack, maybe last you almost a week, and then needs a still switch off uh, within a couple of minutes. This, with the energy densities going up so much, all of a sudden, this can be adopted to all forms of transportation because when, the, when it becomes so much lighter and cheaper, it starts to be trans very transformational in what we can look at this area. So if I start to think of now, we looked at vehicles and we looked at energy, solar and we looked at energy, how does all of this kit together? Well, a large portion is, is linking with the grid. Now, Grid to vehicle is very common, where vehicles come, solar energy uses it, charges the battery, that's great. Um, that's, we talked a lot about it, and that's not a problem. However, there's an opportunity to look at the other way around, where vehicles can look at powering um, the grid back, and, and really optimizing the flow of energy over the whole day, because solar has a lot of peaks when you think about it. They are generally peak during the day and less energy, the zero energy at night and very minimum energy in the, in, the, in the early mornings or late evenings of this area. Interestingly enough, vehicles are being used a lot in the morning and evenings, which shared mobility some more during the day, but in general you have a vehicle usage that's peaking on these areas. You also have an energy usage that's peaking at those points of time. Uh, because in the morning when you're leaving for home, uh, there's an overlap between industrial and commercial and, and housing. And the same thing in the evening, residential and, and, op and commercial applications overlap. And so you have, an, you have an opportunity to look at this energy being gone in, but also coming back when you need a peak area. Going back to the fact that if we needed 300 to 400 million electric vehicles by 2030, Let's assume 200 of them are, are grid compatible on this area, or the battery swapping enables you to separate the usage of batteries and the storage of batteries and, and charging of batteries independent of time, and therefore allows you to uh, leverage this aspect on this area. And 25% of these 200 million vehicles were uh, capable of being connected to the grid at a particular time. You had 100 gigawatts of power. 
that's huge that can you know transform areas cities and, and on, as you look at it and so what happens is instead as you go to renewables it's going to be very essential to integrate it with mobility because then the investments on storage potentially completely go away because you have two forms of connectivity you have connectivity in terms of the grid and energy and you have connectivity in terms of mobile devices and the combination of the two enables you to have a free ecosystem of energy by looking at swapping situations you can also democratize the use of energy and further add another extremely powerful part to the entire equation as you think of it I think sustainable mobility or anything in India that really takes off is when the cost structures come down. If costs are 20% higher, markets are pretty much zero in a country like India. If costs are neutral, there's some market. But if costs drop to 20% lower, you see transformational change. And what we have with the cost of electric vehicles coming down, batteries coming down, is we have the cost structures significantly being lower. We already talked about solar energy cost structures, and they're coming down. Renewable energies are far cheaper today as we think of it here in terms of cost structures. If we think of the solutions related to optimization, both of assets through shared mobility, and then we take the thing of energy where people can actually buy and sell energy and make money on it in the middle of the night or at a peak demand perspective to look at it, you're really optimizing all our resources across this area as we think of it, right? And so I think what was definitely a challenge for us in terms of our 8% growth rate as a country, we can transform into an opportunity, a true opportunity to run on the sun by 2030, all our transportation requirements here. So just to sum up, I think we talked about electric, shared, autonomous, connected, and powered by renewable energy as, as where we see sustainable mobility heading. Four of these, the electric, shared, connected, and renewable energy exists today, are available. Autonomous has just started. You're going to see by 2020 pilots probably running globally. And by 2025, a reasonable amount of penetration. India may be a little longer given our unique traffic conditions and challenges that we have, but probably the most beneficial considering the accidents and issues that we also see. But considering where we are today in this, this is not really where the future is. The future is today something that we can have and make happen right now. Thank you so much.